We're yawning. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Stacy Krim and I'm one of the archivists here in the UNCG Special Collections and University Archives. We're located on the second floor of the main building of Jackson Library, and it is our department's mission to collect, preserve, and make accessible rare and unique historical material. We also teach students how to interpret this material and conduct primary source research. Our archive focuses on local and regional history, rare books, the history of women veterans, the performing arts, and of course, the history of our university. Archival collections can contain a wide variety of material and one type of material we commonly see are letters. Remember before text messaging, social media, and emails, people had to sit down, write a letter, and send it through the mail, often waiting days or even weeks for a response. The letters are a treasure trove of information for our researchers, giving us a day-to-day -day account of people's lives. The following letters we will be reading for you all relate to our university's history in some way. You are going to hear letters from excited students and even a few letters illustrating what courtship was like before the digital age. To start us off, my colleague Kathleen McCarty-Smith will be reading us letters from a former student of our school in the 1940s, Rita Hunter. Hello. So this is Rita Izzard Hunter. She is pictured at the top left of the screen and as are some of her activities. Um, and I'm gonna be reading several letters written by um, Rita today. She was a freshman in 1944, one of a thousand freshmen that year. It was a very unique time on campus as the nation was in the middle of a war. During World War II, the school had been contributing to the Hope Front mobilization efforts by conducting paper drives, buying war bonds, and knitting and sewing for the soldiers. At the time Rita was on campus, the school was called Women, Women's College of the University of North Carolina. It had been an all-girls school since it opened in 1892. Rita was very active during her time at school. She was a chemistry major, and you can see that she was a member of many clubs, including the Boots and Spurs Club for horseback riding. Let's see, Stacey, if you could show in the next slide as well. She lived in Cotton Dormitory um, with her roommate, Catherine Mallory, who is down there at the bottom. There's a picture of Cotton Dorm, and there is the interior, so it looks much different than it did today. She'll also talk about attending <clears throat> functions in ACOC Auditorium, which is now the UNCG Auditorium, which is pictured at the top, and there's the interior at the bottom. So the first letter was written by Rita to her parents in September of 1944. Rita talks about her train trip from her hometown of Lullington, North Carolina to Greensboro and her traveling companion who was going to Greensboro College, which is only several miles from here. She talks about Catherine Malloy, her roommate, um, which is which in Cotton Dormitory located in the quad and meeting new friends. We also see that Rita is having a bit of trouble settling in. She must stand in line to get a post office box. The school has lost her trunk. She's trying to schedule her fall courses and she needs a gym suit. <clears throat> Wednesday, September 21st, 1944. I think, been going to bed at 11.30 and getting up at 6.30, so the days sort of run together. Dear Ma and Pa, honestly, this is the biggest place I've ever seen in my life, and instead of being scared when I get lost, I'm petrified when I go to the right place because it's such a seldom occurrence. Had a real good trip, up, stayed in the lounge the whole trip, and the girls in the black suit that we saw waiting on the platform, she was a junior at Greensboro College, and so we stayed together the whole time. She went down to Lullington and spent a weekend with Dot last winter, so we had a grand time talking about everybody. Bummy and Maxie did come down to the station in Charlotte, and I talked to them for about 15 minutes. They're both coming up to see us some weekend soon. When we got to the station, Gloria said that if Catherine wasn't there, I could go out with her and her aunt and uncle who were getting her because the campus was only about two blocks apart. But Catherine was there and her family, the train was right on time, took me to supper and then out here about 7.30. It was raining. Betsy Ivy and Mrs. Carter are very nice. My junior advisor is Evelyn Griffin and she has 10 others. So we get to, to go to all the different stuff in groups. If you think you have to stand in line in the army, what do you think that this is like with nearly a thousand freshmen? Last night, we went to ACOC Auditorium to a student government meeting, and the auditorium was packed full of what I thought was the whole college, but no, it was just a freshman class. Stood in line an hour and a half last night for a P.O. box. It's 264. So address my letters to me, box 264, 
WC, UNC, and you don't have to put Cotton Hall on it. We've gotten, the, we've gotten um, the room straight now. Kat got some pretty white Dimitri curtains with ruffles and rose tufted bedspreads and a rose tufted rug. My rugs and lamp came today. Certainly do like the rugs. Kay brought a big three-way floor lamp too, and we have two small lights on the walls and a grand big bookcase between the windows, which everyone else envies. Hardly any of the rooms are alike. Our room has the third and fourth windows from the right, first floor. Everything has arrived now except the trunk with my clothes in it. I went to see Mr. Sink, who tends to trunks this afternoon, and he said that there were still a lot of them in the station here, that they just didn't have but trunks, and so it took several days to get them all out here. If it hasn't come in a day or so, I'll wire you. Here's vaguely what I've been doing so far. In spare moments these two days, I have stood in line for everything. Gotten a post office box, a gym suit. I thought we sent a check for it, but I couldn't find my name on the list, so I wrote them a check for 810. Shoes are real good. Got my payment receipt, been to the drugstore and bakery, been all over looking for trunks, and now they have just told us tonight that there are 500 trunks here which have to go to the baggage checks to get them. And yet, when I went over there this afternoon and tried my best to give that man the check, he, he said no, he didn't want it. So I guess I'll force it on him tomorrow. This morning when I went to see Miss Barrow, faculty advisor, she said for me to take the following with chemistry as a major. She said having a major really didn't change any courses hardly except that I take math, which is counted as a science instead of a history. So I'm just as glad. I have English, chemistry, math, health, Spanish, and phys ed. She said I could go either on with the French or start Spanish or German, which was better for majoring in chemistry, but I decided I didn't want to go into it that deep and it wasn't required to take German. It costs $15 to take golf, and they want you to have your own clubs. And so I don't know what I'll take in gym yet. I've seen Marjorie, ugh, Florence Smith, and Lib Holland came by tonight with her mother and daddy. They were here, so we had a grand time talking. Paul Jr. is still at West Point, and Lib is a junior. If my courses don't suit you, write real quick, and they can be changed within a week. I'll take history next year. Guess what? I've been using a hand towel for a wash rag. I think that must be what we forgot and couldn't think of it. Or are there some in the trunk? I need a shoe rack too, but I think I can get one in town. You can go anytime you want to. We register tomorrow and go on a library tour and then classes start Friday. Woe is me. When is the radio coming? I'm about rode out. It's taken me two days to do this. Heaps of love, Rita. Thank So I'm Patrick Dollar. I'm also an archivist in Special Collections, and I have a letter um, from Joseph Edward, or Ed, Normant to Dorothy Turlington. So Dorothy attended uh, Women's College around the same time as Rita. She was a native of Goldsboro, North Carolina, and graduated from Women's College in 1943. After graduation, she taught the fifth grade at Dilworth School in Charlotte beginning in September 1943, and these letters from Ed are from um, various places while he travels around the country with the Standard Registered Company to Dorothy um, in Charlotte. 200 North 4th Street, Hotel Murphy, Richmond, Virginia, care of Standard Registered Company, February 17th, 1946. Dear Dottie, well, I have finally gotten settled after a long search. My associate, who is a nice guy, let me use his car over the weekend for my room hunt. This afternoon, I moved in a nice residential section where I think I will stay. It's rather expensive, but worth the price. How have you been? I've been thinking constantly of you ever since I left. You know, I became very attached to you shortly before I left, and distance increases my longing. I am lonely in this strange town and have pleasant memories of the good times we had in Charlotte. I wish I would have stayed and cultivated your friendship longer. As it is, I feel that I've just scratched the surface of a mighty sweet girl who I can't forget. I hope that our relationship can be more than just pals after we have known one another longer. The word like could easily become another four letter word I know for my part. I wish you could feel the same because I believe you regard me only as a friend. Women are mysterious though, and this mystery increases their charm. You are no exception. Your thoughtful reserve is a fine trait which I admire. As you said, after I've stayed in Richmond a while, maybe we will realize better how things stand. If possible, I shall come to Greensboro Easter. I think it's April 21st. That seems like a long time to me, but I'll count the days. If I have to go to Dayton, we'll make other plans. In the meantime, please write as often as possible and I will do the same. 
Confide in the green-eyed archer whenever you have any deep problems. I'm sure he can advise you. I must close and retire. We'll write again soon and tell about my work after I know more about it. I miss you very much. Love, Ed. Hi, my name is Beth Ann Kelsch. I'm the curator of the Women Veterans Historical Project. I'm chosen to read some letters from Caroline Morrison. Uh, she later joined the Army Medical Specialist Corps and served in World War II. So we have her materials from there, but we also have her um, collection from when she was a student. She was born in September 1921 and was raised in Bethel, Connecticut. She attended Women's College from 1940 to 1944. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Home Economics and then went to complete a year-long dietetic internship and apprenticeship at Walter Reed General Hospital in Washington, DC. In September 1945, Morrison was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the US Army Medical Corps and worked as a dietitian at military hospitals in Georgia, Kentucky, and Texas. She later married Ed Garrett and moved to Cupertino, California, where at the age of 99, she still lives. A couple weeks ago, I called her on the phone to tell her I would be reading her letters for this event, and she was thrilled. Uh, Caroline did an oral history interview for the Women Veterans Historical Project in 2008, and the interview asked her, what made you decide to attend Women's College, which was in the South and so far away from where you grew up? She told him, well, I wanted to get away from New England winters. I was always sick so much in the winter and I was looking for a warmer climate. There weren't many schools in the South in those days that had very high scholastic standing and women's college did. One of my advisors in high school had a niece who was going there and she could tell me all about it. So those were the reasons I went, but I found it was quite a culture shock when I got there for a Yankee in North Carolina. So our parent, my, me and my parents, our first impressions were just that this was a wonderful place and that the campus was so beautiful. We were very much impressed. Once my parents were gone, I got, was pretty homesick in the beginning. No one could understand my Yankee twang and I couldn't understand the Southern accent. It was a little difficult at first. And then a girl came into my room who I'd never seen before and tossed her hair back and said, I had a great aunt who said the proudest day of her life was the day she shot a Yankee and buried him in the garden. So Caroline did eventually, uh, you know, uh, learn to fit in, but that was, uh, she had quite a beginning. So first letter I'm going to read was uh, sent to her uncle Ed on September 15th, 1940. Uh, 206 Hinshaw Hall. Dear Uncle Ed, here I am 600 miles from home and still cold. It does warm up in the middle of the day, but in the morning and at night we almost freeze. Everyone says that it will not last, so I'm hoping for a change. However, they do say it rains about three days a week. At last, I'm beginning to understand a real southern accent, but the girls from the surrounding country towns are still hard to understand. There's a little mountain girl next door who thinks my clothes are purdy, and she always wants to know about my kinfolk. Yesterday, she wanted to know if I rode a mule very often. It is her favorite recreation, so if I go mule riding, I'll send you my picture. The dormitories form a large quadrangle with the middle part all grass. The food is very good, but we have not had many of those Southern dishes I was hoping to get acquainted with. The one thing that we have had that I could not choke down was turnip tops. I never realized before how lucky we were to hear New York radio stations. We can get them very seldom and I'm already getting tired of hillbilly music. The only news program that I can find is sponsored by a snuff company who always assure the radio audience that snuff is much more enjoyable and healthful than cigarette smoking. Do you think I should take it up? I'm enclosing a slip to prove to you that freshmen can have a good time if they have the endurance to take it. I don't believe I will accept this offer to the show and breakfast as it would mean getting up at 530 in the morning, which would be a little hard on the first day of classes. 
Now it is time to walk a mile into town if I can make it. Loads of love, Carol. In 1954, the landmark decision of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka passed ruling that racial segregation of public schools is unconstitutional. In 1956, the Woman's College of the University of North Carolina, now UNC Greensboro, began the process of desegregation when the school admitted our first two African-American students, Joanne Smart and Betty Tillman. The following letter is written by Joanne to her mother and father during her second semester at our school. Joanne and Betty were trailblazers. Both had just graduated from schools that were segregated, so their choice to attend our university knowing they would be the first two African-American students took a great deal of bravery and personal fortitude. Although they were both pioneers, you hear in the letter that Joanne was still very much an excited college first year student, wanting to get involved with student activities and struggling to make good grades. This is the first of two letters I'll be reading from Joanne today. Here is the letter. Wednesday night, February 1957. Dear mother and daddy, this has been a busy day for me. I overslept and didn't have time to go to breakfast. Had a Spanish test at eight o'clock this morning. Hope I did pretty good on it. I made an 83 on one we had last week and that was a lousy C minus. At Ligon, that would have at least have been a bit B minus. They sure grade us hard here, don't they? I don't remember if I told you in my last letter that I was invited to take a part in the university day of prayer for all students. It is a worship service for all denominations that is held in colleges and universities all over the nation on this coming Sunday. There are nine girls participating and I'm one of the nine. How and why they chose me, I'll never know. Anyway, we practice tonight at 7.15 and I'm going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Would love to write more, but at 10.15, we have a section meeting. It's 9.45 now, and I've got to read two chapters of history before tomorrow morning. Write me again real soon. Sure do miss you all. Your daughter, Joanne. Hello. I'm Carolyn Shankle and I work with the Rare Book Collections. My two letters come from the Student Government Association and they give you some insight into how people are um, chosen for positions back in the 1950s. The first letter is dated July 28, 1955. Dear Julia Ann, does it seem possible that school is so close that the callus on your right hand is already growing where the pencil rubs? I'm afraid my callus never went away. Anyway, September will be here in no time and we will again start a busy year at WC. I have something very wonderfully important to tell you, which you'll be quite happy to hear. Julia Ann, how would you like to be treasurer of the student government at Women's College at the University of North Carolina? If you will accept, you are now officially appointed to that station. Get out your Addy machine. Let me explain a bit. As you no doubt know, Alice Smith is now Mrs. Alice Smith Barkley, who is soon expecting a little papoose. Of course she is not coming back to school. Since you are next in line for this honor and very capable of handling such duties, we feel we want you to take her place. Will you? Now, if we have got that settled, let me ask you to preschool conference on September 5th, 6th, and 7th. Our theme is your university, your student government, and you. We will send you other information about it later. I would like to know if you would help us with a planning session called Pipe Dreams. You and Mary Neal Marooney will be leading a group in thinking about some changes and improvements that could be made at school. You and she can get together Sunday night before the conference and discuss this, but you could be thinking about ideas anyway. This is quite a jumbled packed letter. I 
hope you understand everything. If there are any questions, let me know. I'm going to ask Pat Davis to help you in orienting yourself to this new job since she did such a good job last year. Congratulations. Sincerely, Martha Fulcher, President, Student Government Association. And Julia Ann replies, July 31st, 1955. Dear Martha, I was thrilled when I received your letter asking me to be treasurer of the student government next year. It came at a time when I needed a boost badly. You see, Thursday, my father suffered a severe heart attack and he is in critical condition. We know now it will be at least three weeks before we will be able to tell whether he'll pull through. I have talked this over with mother and she and I both feel that unless something terribly unforeseen occurs, I will be back at WC next semester regardless of the outcome of my father's illness. If you will accept my tentative yes, I will be most happy to work with you and SGA this fall. Now, in regards to the preschool conference on the 5th, 6th, and 7th, I will be able to come. But if the time extends over the 7th, I will have to leave as I have been asked to make my debut on September 9th here in Raleigh. Martha, I would like to get in touch with Pat Davis. Of course, I have had no orientation and I feel most inadequate without some type of briefing. The sooner I could get the material, the more secure I would feel. Would it do me any good to make a trip to Greensboro? If there are any reports or files there, I can look over, maybe that would help acquaint me with my duties. Maybe, too, if you could give me a little more of the details on the pipe dreams, I would know along which lines to think. It sounds like a great idea. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I do hope I can do the excellent job that Pat did. I am looking forward to trying anyway. Sincerely, Julia Ann Crater. Thank you. Okay, we're back with Rita. <clears throat> so in the second letter, Rita writes, um, only two days after her first. She's about to start classes, including swimming, and is still paying school fees and buying books. We also discovered that she's finally found her trunk. She talks about visiting local churches. You can see on the slide, there's the Church of the Covenant at the top, which is very close to school. And um, then First Presbyter Presbyterian, which is toward downtown, and her need for a new coat. She also comments on the food, which the students found lacking during the war years because of rationing. Rita also recounts a very unusual experience that she had on a train. Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, September 23rd, 1944. Dear Mother and Daddy, I think I'll be glad when classes start, which is this morning at 9, so I can get some rest. This place is tremendous, and all you do is race around campus and then stand in line and wait. I've gotten all my books now, which cost about $16 and a $4 lab fee. Got my schedule fixed out. Um, Thursday, and I don't have any eight o'clock classes, which I think is perfectly marvelous. I'm taking intermediate swimming in gym twice a week, and it's my last class, so I won't have to go around with, with wet hair. Got my trunk Thursday afternoon. I went down to the basement where they bring them all to look again for it, and I couldn't find it. So I sat down on one to rest my weary feet, and guess whose I had been sitting on? Boy, was I happy. The only thing, it had, evidently been, it had evidently been sitting in the rain because when I opened it, everything that touched the edges and the bottom was soaking wet. It really is lucky that we had the pillowcase on my evening dresses because it, if the green had faded on it, it would have been bad, but it didn't get on my dress. I just hung everything up till it got dry and nothing is hurt. Thank goodness. Last night, all the churches had a party for the members of that church. So Catherine and I went to the Presbyterian church near here. It was real nice, but I think I'll go to First Presbyterian Uptown. A girl from Charlotte who's in Miss Belt's church came to see me several days ago and said that she had a little job for me. I can't wait. Bet you I don't though. 
Well, I'm just back from hygiene. And did you know that you have a chance of living 2.3 years longer now than you did in 1930? Isn't that wonderful? I have this period free and math next period. Then I'll tell you whether I want to live or not. Right now, I'm doubtful. I just looked at the first page and it happens to be one chapter beyond where we stopped last year. Ah, oh, well. After that, I'm, I'm through for the day. Catherine and I and two awfully nice girls from Durham who know Barnes and everybody went uptown yesterday and I got some wash rags, a rose and green shoe bag, which just, um, which just matches the rose bed spreads and cover and a towel rack. I do need an iron though. Can you write to Margaret and get her to send it? I can take it downtown to get it fixed, I guess. Ma, I think you'd look real cute in a red coat. I've decided I want a gray Chesterfield. So remember here. Oh, I forgot to tell you something funny that happened on the train. So we were going to the diner and you know how you go bouncing from side to side when trying to walk through the cars? Well, I was passing some soldier and about the time I got opposite from him, the train practically jumped the track. It felt like it felt like it and the poor fellow tried to miss hitting me, which he did, but he dived through the window and smashed it to shreds. He just looked at the window, patted his shoulder and went on and all because of me. The food is terrible. That's the only way to describe it. So our table looked like a mixture between a greenhouse and a vegetable garden yesterday downtown, and we brought some grand apples and brought them back. Hope I get fat on all the bread and potatoes. We can go down to the corner anytime and get good sandwiches and stuff though. I guess I better start finding math now. Lots of love, and I sure will be glad when Christmas comes. Rita. So we rejoin the courtship of Ed and uh, Dottie, or Dorothy. Um, this is just a couple months from the first letter. Sunday, 10 p.m., Hotel Gibbons, Dayton, Ohio, April 14th, 1946. My dear Dottie, guess what? About two hours ago, I talked to Tidian Turlington. It was good to hear her voice again over the miles. That gal has really got something besides a very special color hair. For some strange reason, I start tingling all over when I think about her. As you are a doctor, how do you analyze this phenomena? Do you ever feel this way? Enough nonsense. You know what I mean. Dorothy, I am really crazy about you and don't care who knows it. I wish I were more of a caveman so that I could set out with my club and bag you in primitive style without giving you a chance to yell for help. On second thought, however, I think Cupid's arrow is much more pleasant a weapon and also more effective. The question is, I'm afraid you can shoot straighter than I can, although I pride myself in being a good archer. Can you put up with this kind of letter? We have been so serious lately, I believe a lighter vein is in order when it means the same thing. Please write me often, anyway, in any vein, and I'll be content. You've gotten me this way and I can't help myself. The symptoms are very bad, but I want to stay sick. Before closing, I want to repeat again, I love you, Ed. Caroline's next letter uh, is was written to her brother, Ed, on September 18th. I'm sorry, brother Sam. I have Ed on the brain from the last letter. Um, September 18th, 1940. Dear Sam, I suppose you will want a letter much more in a couple of weeks than you do now, but by then I'll be a total wreck from lack of sleep or working myself to death. So I feel I must do my duty now. Classes are in full swing and I'm rushed to death. Chemistry has me stumped already. So that shows how much Miss Bond did not teach us. Nanny was looking at my clothes yesterday and she said she was sure I must look angelic in my suit. Certainly the one thing I did not suppose I looked like in those brass buttons with my dashing red hat was an angel. Have you any Farragut banners or stickers you could send me? I'd love to have some and also MIT ones as soon as you can get me some. We have nothing for decoration on our walls and it reminds me of a hospital, so I want some color. Freshman week was better than the welcome wagon in New Canaan. I've had my share of free ice cream sundaes, movies, newspapers, ginger ale, and other refreshments. Already some girls are complaining about the food, and although I can find nothing wrong with it, I must admit that, that there is a certain sameness to it all. 
Every piece of meat we've had so far has tasted just like the last one. This morning we had fried liver for breakfast, which was certainly unusual, if nothing else. Are you going earlier than you had planned or did I get the wrong impression from mother's letter? Please tell her it is all right to abbreviate WCUNC if she could put the letters in the right order, but the WC must come first, not last. The weather has just been like the middle of summer this week, but from what I can hear, the winter will be as cold as good old Connecticut. Please write to your one and only sister. Loads of love, Carol. So we're back with Joanne Smart, who is writing her mom a bit later the same month as her previous letter. Joanne is super excited because she is one of only a few students to be selected by Dr. Warren Ashby, a philosophy and religious studies professor who the Ashby Residential College is named after, to attend an off-campus seminar, probably in Raleigh. We don't know what the seminar is, we just know that Joanne is thrilled. This letter sounds very much like any letter you would expect from an excited student, but goes into some subtle detail, which reminds us that Joanne's experience as an African-American student was different from that of white students. She is letting her mom know that the university has made arrangements for her for meals so that there will be not, not be any trouble. Remember though, our school had desegregated, businesses in the South had not. So Joanne could not take for granted that she would be allowed in the same hotel or allowed to eat in the same restaurants as her classmates. The university had to work out those details for Joanne to attend the seminar. Here's the letter. Thursday night, February 14th, 1956, 11 o'clock PM. <clears throat> Dear mother, you sure gave me a scare tonight. I just knew something was wrong. You see, I know how you and daddy miss me. If I don't write every day, you all get worried about me. I guess now you all will change your mind about letting me come home. When I do, I'm bringing my water gun, okay? Mother, I'm so excited about being invited to attend the seminar. You don't know how much it means to me. Just think, I'll be representing the students of Women's College. When the girl came to ask me tonight, I almost fainted. I didn't know what to say. Dr. Ashby told me that he would love to have me attend if I could. I think it will be a wonderful experience. We leave here Thursday, February 28th, and will return to campus Saturday night, March 2nd, 1957. $12 of the money will not be due until we get there, but I will have to have $3 registration as soon as you can send it. That's $3 in case you couldn't understand my writing. I think I told you we will be staying at the Carolina Hotel and we will eat most of our meals there. I don't know what other restaurants we'll get to, but everything has already been cleared by the school, so there will be no trouble. I'm enclosing the clip of the program I'm participating in Sunday. We'll let you know how things turn out. Write me again soon, and if you don't hear from me, don't get worried. I'm just kidding. I'll write to you every other day, all right? Tell daddy I'll teach him how to swim when I get home. Love always, Joanne. Okay, we're back with Rita. So um, let's see. The next two short letters were written some months apart. The first was written to her parents in November of her freshman year. She was dating, attending lights out parties in the dorm, and talking football. Sunday night, November 19th, 1944. Dear Mother and Daddy, our dorm dance was last night and it was wonderful. Of course, Bobby and several other of the ORMS boys that were coming were restricted at the last minute for something, no telling what, so they didn't get here. It was a girl break anyway. It sure is fun to dance with anybody you want to for a change. How was the game? I saw in the paper that Skip did some good playing, but that's all it said. Last night, a bunch of people upstairs had a little party and invited us up. It was after lights out, so we just turned out the lights and went up. Everyone else down here kept their lights on about a half an hour late, and all of them got called down except us, because they thought we were asleep. Ha ha. Slept till 11 this morning and from 3 to 5 this afternoon. That'll have to last me for the next week now. Mrs. Malloy called Catherine this morning and said that Lauren Berg was going to play football in Chapel Hill Thanksgiving Day for the state championship, and they're going up. So we are too. We've just heard about the president. Oh, Spreck. 
Florence Hecht called me a few minutes ago and asked me to come over there next weekend for a dance and open house and stuff. And I sure would like to go, but not with him. So I let my better judgment rule and made up some dumb excuse. Then he said, well, could you reserve Saturday night, weekend after next for me? And I said, I'm terribly sorry, but I don't think I can and hung up. Cost him 70 cents to call too. Aren't you proud of me? Has my evening dress come yet? Hang it up by the cloth hooks and maybe it won't be so wrinkled. Yes, I've gotten the name, Tate's. Love, Rita. The second was written to her mother in the spring of her freshman year. She is dating, riding horses, and going on a trip to scenic Laurenburg. Most interestingly, she mentions the death of the president, Franklin Roosevelt, who had died only five days earlier. He had been elected to four terms in office and many did not remember a time when he was not president. Dear mother, well, guess what? I dated Bobby Chafin tonight. At long last, he came across, and we had a real good time. I wore my new lavender dress. It's hot. He looked grand in his uniform and holds his shoulders up for a change. Isn't it awful about the president's death? Most of us had just never thought of a day when Roosevelt wouldn't be president, since we had never known anyone else. Went riding Friday, and Lib and I practiced some in pair. Our two horses work real well together. Dr. Reardon, professor of photography, went out with us and took a lot of pictures of the drill and jumping, but not me. She has a camera that takes one one fifty of a second. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to Warrenburg next weekend, so please write my permissions to Mrs. Carter. Next year, we're going to have blanket permissions. Won't you be glad? Sunday morning. It's 92 degrees today. I think they've just forgotten spring this year and jumped right into summer. Played some tennis yesterday. No news. Got to go to dinner now. Love you lots. Rita. So maybe surprisingly to some of y'all, um, Joseph <laughs> Ed Norman uh, did marry Dorothy uh, Turlington on July 20th, 1946. And this last letter comes, um, no, Sean, that is not a restraining order. This, this is their marriage certificate. And this last letter comes um, a few months after they were married. The Sevilla Hotel Apartments, Richmond, Virginia, Monday, 9 p.m., February 3rd, 1947. My dearest Dottie, this will be the first letter addressed to Mrs. J.E. It seems funny because you are Dottie to me and the other thing, others seem strange and formal. How is my sweet wife today? I'm very anxious to hear good news and can't wait till next week to reclaim you from my only rival. I know you will let me hear soon. I had a good rest last night and spent another day outlining and studying my new work. I like the prospects fine if I only had an office. The new building should remedy this though. Tonight I stopped by the hole in the wall and purchased a half pound of ground steak and a can of spaghetti. Then I dug out the potato and cooked a very charming meal. I missed you terribly then and at breakfast this AM. I guess I can hold out for a week, but I couldn't wait much longer. This little apartment just isn't the same and it must miss you too. There isn't much more news to tell. Gabriel Heater has just signed off, so I'll wind this up and do likewise. I think I'll go to bed early tonight and maybe take in a picture tomorrow. I ate so much dinner, I'm getting quite drowsy. The radio predicts real cold weather by tomorrow. It was 1 this a.m., but Dottie was good and didn't freeze. Well, I mean it this time, so good night. It's sort of like my night shift, sleeping all by myself, except nobody rings the bell to wake me up. All my love, Ed. P.S. Love to your mother. Uh, Caroline Morrison is back on September 23rd. She uh, wrote to her father. Dear Daddy, my shoes came today and they are grand. I don't believe I could have gotten along with just one pair, but it was a thrill to get both pairs at once. A bicycle sounds like a wonderful idea, but I don't believe it would work. There are too many steps to navigate, and all the classes are across Walker Avenue, which would make it rather difficult. Now that I'm used to it, I don't mind the walking as much as I did, and it is probably good for me, but it is funny that I have to live in the hall that is the furthest away from everything. I really am very lucky to be in a residence hall, however. Quite a few girls are still living in the infirmary, and others are sleeping three in a room. So considering how late it was when I was accepted, I feel very fortunate. 
you certainly were right about Greensboro being like the Mohawk Valley over the weekend, but all last week and again today, the weather is really perfect. So warm at night, we don't need coats, yet not hot in the middle of the day. Thank you so much for the check, but I felt you had more than repaid me already. My books just cost $22. Some of the girls got them for less by buying them from upperclassmen, but that involved running to all the dorms to find them, and I didn't have the energy at the time. Still have $23 as I spend practically nothing, and that will last me for a long time. Saturday's the only chance I have to go to town, so there are very few temptations to spend any money. The girls christened my stuffed monkey commencement because he was a graduation present and he is becoming quite the mascot. But my Charlie McCarthy doll is still my favorite. He looks so friendly sitting here on my desk. Yesterday, there was a campus checkup. The doors were locked in every building and they took the names of everyone there and found out if everyone was accounted for. Two of the girls from our building could not be found and it turned out that they were off campus, riding without permission. It looks as though that they will be sent home, so has, it has caused a lot of excitement. Tomorrow we have our first chem lab, and knowing the mistakes I made in my first lab, I wouldn't be surprised if some, I wouldn't be surprised if some green freshman blew us up, so listen for an explosion. I enjoy your letters so much. Loads of love, Carol. So although UNC Greensboro had begun the process of desegregation in 1956, most businesses in the South continued to be segregated. For example, in downtown Greensboro, there was a Woolsworth store with a lunch counter and African Americans were allowed to purchase from the store, but they were not allowed to sit down and eat at the lunch counter. On February 1st, 1964, North Carolina A&T students under the, entered the downtown Woolsworth and purchased food and sat down to eat it. And this began a civil rights protest that would sweep our nation known as the Greensboro sit-ins. We know of at least seven students from our school who participated in the sit-ins. They were recognizable because they wore our school's class jackets. So when media coverage began, photographs of our students began to appear in the news. One of these students was Eugenia Seaman, who went by Jeannie, who was originally from Florida. The chancellor of our school at that time was Gordon W. Blackwell, and he viewed his students' participation as something of a scandal for the university. So he wrote to the parents of the students involved, urging them to tell their children not to participate in the protest. The following letter, which is the last letter, in, in, which is the last letter I will be reading in the program, is from Jeannie Simmons' mom in response to Blackwell's letter. In this letter, Jeannie's mom very politely says that her daughter is mature, she was raised with principles, so if Jeannie is not following the advice of the chancellor, there must be something wrong with that advice. Essentially, Jeannie's mom is not going to punish her daughter for doing the right thing, in this case, protesting segregation. Here's the letter. June 3rd, 1960, to the office of the Chancellor of the Women's College of the University of North Carolina, attention Gordon W. Blackwell. Dear Sir, in reply to your letter of May 25th regarding my daughter Eugenia, I find it most difficult to believe that she had not heeded advice given to her by you. Jeannie has been brought up in the religious teaching of the Brotherhood of Man and in a home atmosphere that helped her along to maturity of action in any field as soon as she was capable of assuming it. To my knowledge, she has never defied advice from teachers, leaders, or her parents. We purposefully chose WC as her school, thinking that there she might have the opportunity to put into action some of her religious convictions, since of all the southern states, North Carolina seemed to be strides ahead in obeying our national law concerning integration. However, at the same time, we had confidence that she would not do anything, take any action that would bring undesirable repercussions to the school or her home and family. When I was in Greensboro at the end of May, I had a long talk with Professor Greenfield. Jeannie has had a sociology course with him this year, and he conveyed to me that Jeannie has maximum maturity for her years, and therefore would not defy advice that was well-founded. 
Jeannie and I have already sincerely discussed your letter, and I regret that we both could not have discussed it personally with you. Yours truly, Mrs. Frank Seaman. Okay, Rita's last letter that I'm going to read today was written during the spring of her senior year. The war is over and she's about to graduate. She was going to events, including a progressive dinner, doing some shopping downtown, preparing to go to a party in Chapel Hill, and still talking football. April 29th, 1948. Dear Mother and Daddy, to say the least, this week has been a little too full. Monday night, the dorm had a picnic, which was loads of fun. I ate two hot dogs with all the trimmings, a cheese sandwich, potato chips, a pickle, a donut, and a Coke. That lasted till Tuesday night when all the seniors had a progressive dinner, had cocktails in Mary Faust, a marvelous dinner in Winfield, ham biscuits, potato salad, hot peas with roasted almonds and dessert in North Spencer, ice cream and cake. In the meantime, I did a little studying for my test, Astronomy Wednesday, coordinating today, which I refuse to discuss. Um, it was too horrible to think about. I think Ms. S had decided after four years that there are too many chemistry majors. We shall see. Bio test tomorrow, for which I haven't gotten around to studying yet. Spent the afternoon downtown. You would have thought I'd struck a gold mine for all the money I spent, which brings up another problem. I now have $27.50 in the bank, and I have to write another check tomorrow for Chapel Hill and Isabel's party. Could you please fix it up? Got a real pretty brows? thin cotton with lace and tucks down the front. Looks real nice with my suit. And I got an evening dress too. Didn't intend to even look for one, but I went to Neil's with Margaret to pick up a dress since she was giving me a ride back and was just looking through the evening dresses and that one struck me. I put it on and I bought it. It's Raffle, it's Raffle PK and I can't describe the print, but it's gray, black, pink, and white stripe with a sort of scroll design in the stripe. Doesn't that sound very pretty? It really is. Goodness, this drawing makes matters worse, but I think you'll like it. It has crinoline under the bustle on the hips and the material is in folds over them. Little white PK ruffles all around the top and it's strapless at this point, but could have had a white straps very easily. It was $25, which I thought was very good. It's very much like the one I tried on at the mother daughter shop that we liked. Hope you like the little Mother's Day gifty. Go on and open it because you might be able to use it now. Got the two packages today, thanks a million. That mix up about Dot's wedding sounds like a huge mess. Let me know any further developments. Had my last boot and spurs meeting tonight. Certainly am glad all that's over, but it was fun. Tell Mrs. Footman that, that Campbell is president for next year. I think she'll be real good. Got a letter from Dick Morton today and he's coming to junior senior dance next weekend. Hope you can come up too. May day is at four. WC is turning out en masse for Carolina this weekend. There's a football game at two, a concert at four, and the dance last night. Big doings. Past time to study. P.S. I need a checkbook. Lots of love, Rita. So we hope you've enjoyed our letters today. And if you are interested in learning more about UNCG's campus history, you might want to check out our history blog, Spartan Stories, where we have many, many essays and articles written about our campus's history, and also UNCG Digital Collections, which has a lot of the primary source material about our campus history, as well as our other collections. And you can always follow us on social media. We're open this semester between nine to five by appointment only. So if you're interested in helping us, us helping you with research, feel free to contact us by email or telephone. Thank you all for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.